My name is Nancy Jedidas. I will be your host today. I am the Director of Higher Education at Immigrants Rising, and I'm really excited to be here with a great cast of panelists and individuals. We're really excited that all of you are here. Just to give you a quick overview of some of what's going to be going on today, um, this is our, our, our agenda for today. I'm going to be doing a brief welcome, um, give an overview of a strong task force, some of the elements of a strong task force, and introduce you to the new resource that my colleague Madeline Villanueva and I created. We're going to be able to hear from some amazing panelists and hear about task force and action, about how some of this work is actually taking place on college campuses and universities. We're going to be hearing around statewide models of building task force. There'll be a short period of time for Q&A, but do rest assured that we looked at all of the questions that you put into your registration, and we incorporated that into a lot of the, the um, presentation that we're having today. We're going to do a quick evaluation and then a closing. Three words of advice from our amazing panelists about the next steps that each of you can take to bring your institutional support to the next level. Before we actually get started, though, I do actually want to just start with a statement of solidarity, recognizing that this is a one week um, marker of the violence that took place in Georgia. And I just wanted to read the statement that Immigrants Rising put out, which just says, Immigrants Rising stands in solidarity with Asian American communities in Georgia and across the nation. We are committed to serving all undocumented immigrant communities and creating an America where everyone, regardless of race, gender, or immigration status, can pursue opportunities free from fear. We condemn the elevated rhetoric of hatred and the rampant misogyny that affects immigrant women, and we lift up the lives of immigrant women, often living in the margins to survive. And if you are interested in being able to show more support, you can actually um, click on the, Madden's gonna throw in the link, the Advancing Justice, Atlanta's Collective Community Statement, and also possibilities to be able to provide support directly to those who were affected. I'm just gonna take a second and honor those that were lost and the commitment that all of us have to ending racist violence and creating communities where all of us can be safe. For those of you that aren't familiar with Immigrants Rising, we are an organization that empowers undocumented young people to achieve their educational and career goals through personal, institutional, and policy transformation. All three of those are really important. We're going to be focusing a lot today on the institutional transformation that we can do, but we're super excited um, and recognize that those, those are interchangeable and work collectively together. A little bit about myself. I work as a director of Higher Education Immigrants Rising. I've been involved with the organization for about 10 years. Um, and I work, my dedicate my work to really building and elevating institutional practices at colleges and universities, creating educational resource materials, working with undocumented young professionals. And I also am part of the Catalyst Campus leadership team. But my work with undocumented students started back at San Francisco State University. And I wanna give a shout out to San Francisco State because that's actually, I was that's where I started my task force work um, and know the importance of being able to build together as more than one individual to try to be able to create the collective change that led to San Francisco State being able to have a full-time coordinator and an undocumented student center on our campus. So thinking about that. Also super excited about our, our amazing panelists today. We have Dr. Cynthia Mosqueda. She's from El Camino College, Ana Miriam Baragón Santoyo, from CSU Dominguez Hills, Alonso Reina Rivarola, he is from Salt Lake Community College, and Maricela Hernandez, who is from the Foundation of California Community Colleges. You'll be hearing from them individually, and I'm ex really excited to hear about how they put that task force work into action on their campuses. Love seeing everybody saying where they are from the chat, because we before we get started, you know, just telling you about the purpose of today's webinar, it is to provide a roadmap to strong task forces to better support undocumented students by strengthening institutional buy-in and the cross-departmental collaboration, which is key. We know that the work for undocumented students cannot just be limited to one person or one center. It needs to be campus-wide, buy-in on an institutional level, and we have some great strategies and tactics today to help you with some of those pieces. Our outcomes for today are really hoping that you will gain a new or deeper understanding of how to be able to use our task force resource to increase campus-wide support. 
to gain new areas of focus and structures for your task force, whether it's just getting started or you wanna take it to the next level. Also, we have some great strategies to be able to help you gain more active task force members with the emphasis on active, right? Like it's super important that we just don't have committee members, but that people who are actively engaged so that when they come to meetings, you know, they're actually coming up with great ideas and not just listening to a report back on other pieces. And you'll also hear from some of the successes, great successes and some of the challenges that undocumented student task forces have faced and overcome and are able to celebrate right now. So excited for that. And again, really excited to see all of you saying where you're from in the chat, throw it in if you haven't yet. We have over 350 people who registered, um, educators, staff, students, administrators, community organizations. I have so much gratitude and appreciation for the work that you do. We have people from Massachusetts, from Florida, from Texas, from Utah, from Wisconsin, California, almost all of the community colleges are represented. And as I was looking over the registration, I was so excited to see that it wasn't just one person or two people from a school. One school even had 12 different members that were coming because it is that collective um, understanding that we all need to be able to take our task forces to the next level. So just big shout out to you, big heart, much love, and really excited to see how we can move forward together. In terms of just trying to give an overview of the Strong Task Force, um, as my, my colleague Madeline Villanueva and I put together this Developing a Strong Undocumented Student Task Force on your campus with the intent that we could really elevate promising practices, identify specific tasks that different colleges and universities could take on, and really create a structure and have a plan for engagement that would improve your campus climate, that will improve the ability of undocumented young people to excel in their college and career path and really maximize the impact and maximize the support available to undocumented students. This guide is actually a, a compilation of research from the different campuses and universities, colleges and universities that we've been able to work with directly or that I've been able to present to or in, educators spoken to. So it's really like a conglomeration of different areas of work that we've seen that are really effective in helping support and elevate that next level of institutional buy-in on your campus. So that we definitely hope that you download and use our new resource. I'm just gonna go over a couple of different pieces quickly in terms of some of the elements of a successful task force. I do think it's really important that there are clear roles and responsibilities for each member. So as I was saying that it's not an advisory committee, it's an active task force or an active engaged committee that is building, that includes representation from key departments, um, the student services side of the house, as well as the academic side of the house. We need faculty and student services working together to be able to make sure that individuals are able to achieve their academic and career goals. Super important also for the participation of undocumented students to be able to be represented on the task force. This is not work that we're doing for undocumented students, but by and with undocumented students. And how can we build on the skills of, and the positionality of each individual to be able to be the most effective that we can. Also really important to have diverse membership beyond just Latinx support services and or programs. If you listen to the news many times, you know we're always thinking about that this is the news would lead us to believe that immigration is a Latinx issue only, but in fact, individuals who are undocumented come from all over the world. There are large undocu API, undocu Black, undocu European. So thinking about those um, in terms of when we're doing our outreach and our representation on the task force that we have diverse representation. And really, I think most importantly in many ways that this work of the task force should not um, rely solely on the coordinator of undocumented student services. Too often I've spoken to undocumented student center coordinators or liaisons on the different campus. And every time an idea comes up, they're like undocumented, oh, talk to X person, oh, talk to Y. How can it be like, you do this, I'll do that. We'll pull the pieces together and it comes together collectively in that way. And thinking about how you can have short-term and long-term goals so that you're not all just focused on rushing to one. And then once you get there, what's the next step? Let's like you know, today, tomorrow, next year, how can we be working together to achieve the kinds of goals that we want to? And then thinking about addressing roadblocks and seeking buy-in from campus administration, all really key elements of successful task forces from the research that we've done. 
Also, in terms of some of the different models that you'll see, um, the models of a task force really start with committed educators. And I have a picture here of some amazing committed educators that were presenting at our Catalyst um, convening. But I think when you're thinking about what is a task force, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. There might be a technical task force definition, but the way in which we are using task force has many different models which are there. So some of in terms of the creation, it can be an informal task force where groups just get together and think about um, how they're able to address some of the issues that are going on campus. Other times it can be a more of a formal task force where the vice president or the president or the board of trustees will create a task force and appoint different individuals. I've also heard of models on campuses where people just get together for different issues that need to be resolved. So, um, you know, we're just recognizing that there are many different ways in which these models can take place across the state. In terms of leadership, there can be co-chairs, there can be one chair, there can be rotating leaders. It really depends on what's gonna work best for your campus. But we do think in terms of the coordination, I've seen the coordination as the DRC USP coordinator or the liaison, an administrator sometimes does that, faculty does that, interested parties. But again, just wanting to reiterate that it should not all fall directly on the undocumented student liaison or coordinator, although they definitely should be intricately involved in the work that is being done. And most importantly, it is having a model that works for your campus so that we're not saying it's not one size fits all, it's what size fits your campus and how can we help you get the tools that you need to bring it to the next level. In terms of the different areas, you'll see that in our guide, we have eight different areas that we listed all the way from student leadership, you know, campus climate, student programming and such. And I'm just gonna hit on a couple of those in a little bit more detail today. Some of the areas that we think are really important, if you're just getting started, professional development is a great place to get going. Madeline's gonna throw in the chat some of these different um, resources that we have, but looking at the Undocu College Guide tool and um, equity tool executive summary can be really helpful. The guide that was created towards building on-campus undocumented student programs. The President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration has great resources and they have this amazing map, kind of like bringing ulead.net into their resource map to be able to show nationwide some of what's going on. United We Dream is also a great organization to follow. And thinking about institutional practices. Another area of focus is really reviewing and developing undocu-friendly websites, not just in an undocumented website, but what's going on with your admissions department, what's going on with your financial aid department, your scholarship department, your career department, taking a quick check and pulse of that and trying to see how you can streamline the process for AB 540 and the California Dream Act. Two more areas of support. The third one is really financial support. This campus specific scholarship or emergency fund is actually how the task force got started at the university that I was at. We got together to create a scholarship that would be specifically for undocumented students. Uh, many of you during the CARES Act um, um, prohibition of being able to provide that to undocumented students created emergency funds got a relationship going with your university foundation. Can that continue? Could they identify specific donors? And how can you use equity metrics to be looking at the kinds of funding that you have? And last, really just thinking about student data and protection. Like last, but definitely not least, we want to make sure that FERPA is understood by all and understood not just in the idea that it's a lock to the outside, but that it does allow for educational purposes for you to use the data to do better retention, milestone data, outreach and, and um, resource sharing, making sure that some of the models by the California Attorney General are established and having a campus-wide action plan for emergencies. So that's just a quick overview of some of the different infer areas that are in our amazing guide. And right now, um, and so I hope all of you download it. And now I'm actually really excited, as I know all of you are as well, to be able to see what our task force is like in action. So I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Cynthia Mosqueda, and she's going to be sharing information with you about what's going on at El Camino College. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. That, that was so amazing. I don't know what I could add to that. It was so good. So good morning, everyone. Uh, buenos dias. I'm so happy to see all the different colleges uh, that are represented um, in the chat this morning. It, it, it's so amazing to see that. 
Um, so a little bit about our undocumented task force and, and just a little bit of history of how we got started um, at El Camino College. We actually launched the, uh, the task force in 2017 um, and it came really um, organically, um, partly because a lot of our students were really fearful of what a Trump administration would look like for them um, at that time and, and still today, there's still a lot of anti-immigrant um, um, sentiments. And so a lot of our students were really concerned and under the, the leadership and direction of our uh, president superintendent, Dr. Maloney, um, she um, basically assembled um, a task force at our campus. And um, the task force does consist of people from across um, different areas. We wanted to be very intentional about who was on the task force, specifically looking at all the points of entry, um, where some of the barriers were for our undocumented students and making sure that those folks were represented as part of the task force. So really anybody who was touching undocumented students in any kind of way, whether that was an outreach, whether that was an admissions process or financial aid. So we do have cross representation from some of the um, areas that you see in my slide, um, but we also have um, faculty that are part of the task force. Student representation is key. So for those of you who do not have a task force yet and you're thinking about doing it, um, it's really important that you include the students early on. So for our undocumented task force, we have um, the president of our Undocu Warrior Club. We have the vice president. We also have students across campus that are represented in the task force. So definitely want to have student representation. We meet anywhere between, between two to three times per semester. But sometimes we'll have additional um, meetings if something you know really um, major has occurred. Um, and as you know, the last four years, there have been a lot of last minute announcements and so sometimes we'll have additional meetings um, that will take place throughout the academic um, term. Uh, there's a lot of work that we've done and tackled in the task force, but one of the, I think, main things we were really looking at is how can we improve processes for all of our undocumented students from the time they hear about El Camino College to the time they make a decision that they want to attend, how does our you know, our outreach services out in the community, are they also being mindful um, in, in making sure that they are talking about undocumented students during their presentation? So that's just a little bit. Um, another key area I think that's also important to, to mention is legislation. Because the legislation is continually changing, um, it's important that at the local level that a lot of the new legislation um, is being enacted, that we're following the legislation, um, especially when it has to do with changes being made to AB 540 as well as um, a, uh, AB 68. If you can change the slide for me, um, Nancy, thank you. Um, and this is just a little bit of some of the work that we've done under an undocumented task force, everything from participate in undocumented student week of action. We did create undoc undocumented uh, warrior welcome um, orientations. We have trained all of our outreach counselors, all of our student ambassadors that go out and work directly with undocumented students to make sure that the language is, is inclusive, that if they're talking about FAFSA, they're also talking about the California Dream Act. Um, we have partnered with Immigrant Rising to make sure we're using and implementing a lot of the tools that they've already, correct, um, um, already designed. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel, um, really get familiarized with their website. They have some amazing tools. And probably one of the most, the, the things that I'm most proud of at El Camino is that when the CARE, CARES Act funding came out during the pandemic and um, undocumented students were not included, El Camino College use 100% of our state allocated funding for undocumented students. This is a conversation that took place quickly uh, as part of our task force. We wanted to make sure that even though undocumented students were not um, included in the CARES Act, that we would make sure that we redirected some of the state aid. And so that kind of gives you a breakdown of how students were awarded. They did not have to apply for this money. This money was posted to their financial aid award letter and then deposited into their, their bank accounts. And the awards range based on if you were full-time status versus six to nine units, or if you were only enrolled in one class. And we're really, really proud of that. If you can go on to the next slide, please. And then um, 
lastly, um, our undocumented task force, with the help of our students, when we asked them what help that they needed, um, they really wanted to, us to go out and do undocumented training for our high school counselors. So as of today, we have trained over 165 high school counselors, um, specifically within the El Camino College District, and that's something we're really, really proud of. So I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy, and I'll be back later on to answer any questions you might have. Sorry, we're going to be going now to um, speaking with Ana Miriam Montoya, excuse me, Ana Miriam from Dominguez Hills. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and thank you everybody who is also here in this webinar. I am so happy to share um, information with you. And so our uh, task force at Dominguez Hills is actually called the Undocumented Student Allied Coalition. And really every day we meet or every time we do something, it's history in the making for our campus as well, right? And so can we go to the next slide, please? And I wanna share a little bit of background in terms of like uh, when we established ourselves. So this is before I came into Dominguez Hills. It has been a seven year history, right? So they started in 2014 and their mission was to really discuss, advocate and raise awareness about undocumented student issues on campus. Um, in addition to that, one of their um, goals was to just really start like educating like faculty and staff on campus about who are the undocumented students. and so so they decided that they wanted to establish undocumented student allied trainings. Um, that was one of their main goals and they started establishing it right away. Um, in addition to that, they said that they wanted to make sure that they had a dream center on campus with dedicated staff. And so they also accomplished it four years later, right? After like the committee actually started. And so it did take some time. And so I want to encourage all of you to just really think about your long-term, um, your short-term and long-term goals. And then other of their accomplishments included hosting events for undocumented students, things that dream centers tend to do now that this coalition was doing in 2014, right? So they were hosting like healing circles, like public forums for undocumented students to come and talk about their issues. Um, and also like undocumented um, talks, right? Where they brought in speakers to motivate students as well. Can we go to this next slide, please? Um, in addition to their accomplishments, right? Like um, things have changed a lot. And so I came into Dominguez Hills about two years and a half ago and I joined the committee. There were already two chairs um, in the committee as well. And so it was nice for me to be a member rather than being like the, the chair of the committee. And one of the things that um, I noticed was that they also included students into this conversation. And I noticed there was a question in the chat about like, should we include students in this task force? I say yes, right? And the reason why is because I've noticed the benefits of including them and really having them guide the work that we do, right? Be able to talk about the problems that they're facing, but also sometimes represent um, other students. So we are intentional about the students that join this committee. Uh, we have decided that every student um, led organization that does work with immigrant um, with immigrants, like they're invited to join our committee, right? And they're able to share like what the needs are. And in addition to that, we're also really mindful about not asking students to chair committees. And I'll talk a little bit more about what committees I'm talking about. And so we have students, staff, faculty, and some administrators as well. And then in terms of recruitment, we are based on interest, but sometimes depending on the committees that, or like the needs that we have, we also do target outreach. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on um, how we do that. And then for meetings, uh, we meet twice a semester, and this is actually our new structure uh, for this academic year. We meet twice a semester. We also always have a summer retreat where we just talk about the goals, whether we accomplish them, um, the challenges we faced. And then outside of those uh, meetings, we also have individual committee meetings um, based on the need. And then in terms of the support, so for our members, we every single year, we actually go through the list and we start 
are eliminating folks that did not show up, people who are not communicating, people that are not showing up to support, right? So we have active members who are constantly part of like the meetings and are also part of like committees um, or like subcommittees that we have. And then we have other types of support. So the other types of support look very different. So every time the Dream Center needs help with um, some sort of project or program or something else on campus, we email the committees and say, hey, we need your help with X, Y, and Z. And a lot of folks actually volunteer from, from our meeting as well. And then can we go to the next slide, please? And then I also wanted to point something out here. Um, we decided that we were, two years ago, we decided that we were gonna move from um, just having two chairs um, and having monthly meetings to actually changing it to committees. And so when I moved to Dominguez, like I said, there were two chairs of the committee. And then the following year, they, it was kind of expected that I was gonna take over and that I was gonna become the chair of the committee. And I'll be honest, I always know that this is not, um, it was not my priority and I did not have the capacity to be chairing this entire like um, coalition, right? And so I suggested and proposed that we um, broke ourselves or divided ourselves into different committees depending on the needs and the priorities of undocumented students. And so every year the committees also change. So this is our second time doing committees. And this year, for example, we did wellness, funding and research. And research was really from a conversation where we talked about like professional development and the lack of like you know, undocumented students pursuing graduate degrees. So we ended up reducing it to just re like focusing more on like research opportunities for undocumented students. And so what are the different roles? So we have the administrative support that actually does come from the Toro Dreamer Success Center. Um, it's very minimal. We send uh, communication um, in terms like through email, and then we also do calendar invites, but that's all we do. And then there's also committee chairs. Um, and then in terms of communication, like I said, right, like we also have a Dropbox that is shared with all committee members and they have access to almost every single like meeting notes and important documents as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, in terms of the challenges, like, look, I don't want to sugarcoat like um, how easy this is, right? Because there's um, structural changes, right? So sometimes that, that can um, not motivate some members if things are changing constantly. And our structure sometimes changes every year, right? We were meeting every month last year. Now we meet twice a semester, right? And so also we have noticed that membership has also decreased which sometimes that's not a bad thing because you stay with the committed individuals, right? Um, what we have noticed though, that there is a limited uh, capacity to take on additional roles for other members. So it does fall on the Dream Center to send those email reminders, to send those calendar invites. And then the other one is that we don't have official recognition from the university. And actually it's a Dominguez Hills thing, right? Like none other committee really has official recognition. And I'll explain why it's a challenge. Can we go to the next slide, please? Anna, we're so excited to hear all of what you're up to. We're actually closing on time, so I'll go to the oh. next slide, but we need to yeah. transition. Yeah, definitely. So this is, uh, so can we go to the next slide, actually? Um, and so these are some of the things that we have accomplished, like um, distributing scholarships, and then the last slide, which is um, the final one. Um, is also research. And this has been one of the most amazing projects just because we now have a lot of undocumented students involved in conducting their own research as well. So highly recommend for you to start a coalition as well. Thank you. Wow, that is so exciting. There's so much going on, just really inspired by the work at Dominguez Hills, as well as what's going on with El Camino College. And I'm really excited now that we're gonna be able to be hearing from Alonso um, talking about what's going on in, in Utah. Alonso, take it away. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. So I'm really excited to be here with you all today. My name is Alonso Reina Riverola, pronouns El He, and I am the Assistant Director for the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs at Salt Lake Community College. I am also the Chair-Elect for the NASPA Undocumented Immigrants and Allies Knowledge Community. And I'm also a DACA recipient. So I really wanted to be open about that and you know, talk about how that also informs my role in working on these committees and um, here in the state of Utah. So two things, I wanna talk about the system of higher ed and I also wanna talk about my particular institution that I'm at right now, Salt Lake Community College. Um, in 2014, that's when the Utah system of higher ed brought a team 
of higher ed professionals, one representative at each public college and university, and one from um, and two from private uh, institutions, and then one um, representative from the Utah system of higher ed together to work on issues affecting undocumented immigrants. So even before we had a formal uh, committee or task force in an, an institution of higher ed, we had it at the state level. And I think that's really important. So for states that are barely starting out or maybe have more capacity to do this at the system of higher ed level, um, this could also be a really good recommendation. So the purpose of the group was of course to address educational inequality and access, but also policy, because we knew um, all of us who were stepping into these roles were familiar with working with undocumented students. And we knew that the policies were not being read the same across the state. So some institutions interpreted policies in one particular way, while other institutions interpreted policies in other ways. So this group really like um, came together to kind of like assess um, those policies and in that way also you know create tools that our different institutions could use and adapt to be able to support the students who are undocumented much more effectively uh, part of that um, you know part of that mission in itself was um, creating an undocumented training um, which a few of us were able to develop at the state level and we partnered with the Utah Board of um, Education or the Utah State Board of Education so the K-12 wing of education in Utah to be able to um, provide trainings to K-12 uh, folks. So that included counselors and teachers. And we were able to partner in a way that these um, trainings would count towards their um, changes of lanes, right? So they can get promotions and um, races. Um, so that really helped us you know, build a strong tool that was widely used in our state um, for a long time. Um, that's some of our accomplishments. Of course, um, we struggled for a little bit, right, in terms of like finding people who could like be committed to the task force. We know that people are stretched too thin and, you know, it's another responsibility, but nonetheless, everyone who came together in that room was absolutely passionate and dedicated about undocumented students, which really helped us um, kind of have a solid foundation. Now, the Utah system of higher ed rep um, the role changed and now they have a state director for equity and advocacy who's the person who's in charge of you know bringing people together um, she's the person who like sends emails out broadly to um, all of our institutions of higher ed to bring someone <clears throat> to oh, excuse me as i'm joking <laughs> to bring someone to uh, the, these meetings and i think that's really important uh, because <clears throat> um, Another one of the challenges that we faced was the fact that, you know, all of these meetings were hosted in Salt Lake City, which is the capital of Utah. And some of our some of our partners were, you know, located miles and miles south or north. So we were able to broadcast them in. And this was pre-COVID, obviously. So now that we have, you know, a much more established Zoom presence that can also really aid us in the process of um, bringing together these folks. Um, and we'll go to the next slide and I'll be quick on that. Thank you. Um, at Salt Lake Community College, we were able to establish the task force in 2015, and that also came together um, to, <clears throat> as Nancy mentioned, to like really work on a scholarship. Um, in 2015, that's a year that SB 253 passed, which actually made it so that public scholarships administered through a higher ed institution in Utah would be open to undocumented students. So um, a committee here was formed to be able to kind of analyze how to make that possible, right? So how to um, bring more money for undocumented students and also how to award the scholarships to students. And that really brought a group of about 15 people here on campus together from different um, sides of the college, right? From academic affairs to student affairs. And as well as one off-campus partner, we thought that was really important. Um, part of the institutional partners included students. So we also had student rep, um, as well as people who identify as undocumented um, professionals. Um, I think one of the challenges was bureaucracy, of course, right? Um, not because the school wasn't supportive. In fact, it was very supportive and they're the ones who brought us together, but um, we still had to abide to you know, some institutional processes and protocols that you know are maybe hard to skip. So that could slow things down sometimes, right? So we wanna be really conscious of that. But nonetheless, a couple um, of big accomplishments was um, in the early stages, our president uh, was able to release a statement, which is on our website, and it's really beautiful and supportive because it's it's something really small, but uh, you know at least it sends a strong message to our students who are applying to school that you know they could access like these resources, which is really important. 
Uh, secondly, we were able to bring the Docu student ally training here and adapt it to our institution. And that's been accessed widely. Um, that also led to the creation of the Brewing Dreams Scholarship Program and Mentorship Program, as well as an emergency fund. And um, lastly, the opening of the Dream Center here in Salt Lake Community College. And I'll be good at that. Wow, Alonso, that's a lot of work. I love how you talked about that being both on the statewide level as well as with individually with your campus community. So I'm gonna ask Alonso, Anna, and Cynthia all to just join us for a few minutes to do some quick questions. Um, one I'd just like to pose to each of you is, how, did you find this resource useful and how are you actually going to be putting it in to use on your campus? Who'd like to go first? I can go first to talk about this. I loved, love, love the resource just because um, it reminded me as well of other issues that we can also be touching upon, right? And knowing that we have so many folks that have gone through our ally training because of the coalition, right? And folks who have said, hey, how can I help out, right? So I think we could be maximizing as well um, those folks that are interested to touch upon some of the things that the resource actually talked about. The other great reminder of the resource was like being intentional about not centering Latinx uh, lives and to be like intentional about reaching out to other folks who are not Latinx to join the committee as well, right? And so those were some of the great reminders for me. That's great, Alonso or Cynthia? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in really quickly and say the same, like, you know, similar to Anna Medium, um, we, I was able to review the, the guide and I found it really helpful as well as, you know, to kind of like reflect on how we're doing um, internally and what we can do better. Um, I also like the part that, you know, um, you know, helped us reflect on who is participating actively and who's missing. So I think that's going to be really important as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, Nancy, I'm sorry, I had lost my sound, so I didn't hear the question. Just wondering about um, the using the resource, but actually given time, maybe I could just jump over and um, people are asking about how to gain the buy-in of key people in key departments on your campus, you know, especially when you're trying to build new practices, multiple stakeholders, what kind of strategies did you guys use? If you could just br briefly answer that. I, I think at El Camino, um, we were really intentional about making sure we were building partnerships with all the key areas that I think undocumented students were, were facing barriers with when they would come to our institutions and just kind of trying to work together as a team to figure out how we can solve some of these barriers, um, whether that was at the affidavit you know, process for the student, whether that was um, when we were out um, at high schools doing outreach, making sure we were intentional by um, making sure we're inclusive of undocumented students. So for us, it was a lot of uh, partnership building, relationship building, having one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with all these different areas. That was kind of like already um, happening before the task force um, actually uh, took place. So just kind of formalize some of that by building it into the task force. That's great. Exactly. Anybody else want to jump in on that? One of our strategies was to do target outreach and also tap into our members network, right? So if I didn't have a relationship with our research, um, research undergraduate research office, right? It was like asking the members of like, okay, does anybody have a relationship already with the chair of the, you know, the entire um, uh, undergraduate research committee? And so it was about bringing him into actually to join USAC and now he's one of our most active members. And so it's, again, it's a strategy of really tapping into each other's network already. That's exciting, yeah. Another question, Alonso, I wonder if I could ask this for you and then to other members of the committee as well, but in speaking with a lot of undocumented student advisors and having had the role myself, I know somehow sometimes getting people to take on task wasn't easy and accountability feels really hard when like super everybody is overstretched. How did you address this and what are some of the strategies that you and your task force used? That's a great question, thank you. So committees are definitely helpful. Um, you know, I think um, you spoke to, you know, one phenomenon that happens very often in higher ed, which is the diffusion of responsibility, right? As soon as we identify someone who works explicitly with undocumented students, everything goes to them, right? So from advising to fundraising to programming, everything is on them. So um, the committee has been really, um, 
really creative in finding ways of like, you know, assigning leadership roles to people who are not our, um, you know, Dream Center coordinator on campus, right? She's brilliant and great, and she carries on a lot of the work as well. I don't want to dis dismiss that, but um, other people in the committee are taking active roles in, um, you know, leading efforts, you know, which include also like our fundraising efforts, and they tap into like, you know, our expertise to be able to like edit ask you know, letters for like gifts and donations or um, for example another um, team is tasked with like re-envisioning what the structure looks like for the committee so and again we're really intentional about no, not overburdening like you know our undocumented student resource center person here on campus because we know how taxing that can be for them as well. Thank you so much. Ana Maria Marcentia would you jump in on that? I'd love to jump in on that because I think that's one of the great reasons of why you should have an undocumented task force so that the work doesn't belong in just to one person or in one different area. And I think one of the great things about the task force is that everyone has stepped up and everyone has taken a role, um, you know, whether that's us working closely with our partners in EOPNS, um, when they're doing a programming for undocumented students, we support the work that they do, or whether we're doing, you know, programming that's coming out specifically of one, one department or one specific area. So I think that's been one of the, the, the great advantages of having an undocumented task force is that there are multiple people who care about this work and who are creating programming across campus and that is touching undocumented students in positive ways. Yeah, thank you. That's exciting. Um, a quick question that I just wanted to see is like, how has your task force moved your campus towards actually building a better campus climate? Who'd like to start? I'm happy to go with that one as well. So here at Salt Lake Community College, um, one of the things that we found really helpful is that, again, we also took kind of like the lessons that we learned from the youth system of higher ed in reassessing and um, auditing our policies, right? So we look at our in-house policies through an undocumented lens and say, okay, how are, are these policies open or not open to undocumented students? And from there, we go on into addressing them. So whether like, you know, re-envisioning them or making more, you know, or making them more inclusive. Um, a concrete example of that one would be our um, HB 144 affidavit, which is our in-state tuition or non-resident tuition waiver that we, we were actually quite recently able to revisit and make much more clear for students who are applying to our school. Um, so I really appreciate that about our committee in terms of kind of not only bringing in money and being able to distribute those funds to students. Another example is during COVID, right? Especially with our students not being eligible for the CARES Act in Utah, um, you know, well, nationally too, but in Utah being such a conservative state also, um, that committee was able to, again, use their emergency fund system to be able to award undocumented students money um, during this time of crisis. So again, that was really, really neat to see. Anybody else quickly? And we're gonna, um, we'll have a little bit more time for questions afterwards. So I'm going to now invite um, Maricela if she can. Um, Maricela would have you jump in and talk a little bit about how we have built this work, how you've been working, building on this work on a statewide level. So statewide task force. So Maricela, I'd love to hear what you have to add to the conversation. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you for, for having me. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Maricela Hernandez. My pronouns are her, she, ella. And I work for the Foundation for California Community Colleges in this um, statewide lens that, that you know, we're, or approach that we're trying to take um, in order to support undocumented students. So um, for those of you that are not familiar with our work, um, so basically we are like the sister organization of the Chancellor's Office. And um, our mission is really to add support to the California Community College system. Within our foundation um, team, we have two members on so myself. I oversee the Undocumented Student Action Week and um, Undocumented Student Support Project, which you'll get to learn a little bit more um, throughout the presentation. And then my colleague, Alonso Garcia, who oversees the Immigration Legal Services. Next slide, please. So um, to tell you a little bit, so my background um, you know, uh, in this work is really as a coordinator. Um, I had the privilege in, 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 um, of an opening two undocumented student centers, so one at the Sacramento City College, the Dreamers Project Report, uh, Center and the Dreamers Project Program and um, at Sierra College, the Undocumented Student Center. And it is that 
um, lens and vision that really uh, helped me when uh, putting together the work at the state, uh, you know, as a statewide or as a system, um, because I, I had that approach of a, system, of, a, of a coordinator, right, and what that means to be a coordinator in the work and the, and the various that our coordinators are facing. So um, what we did um, with the Undocumented Student Support Project is that we started an undocumented liaison network. So um, for those of you that are not from California, California has a legislation that requires um, all of our higher, higher education institutions to have a contact person for undocumented students, um, a dream center coordinator, uh, or not necessarily a coordinator, but a contact person. So uh, in our system, we decided to go with undocumented liaisons. And um, how we started our work is we, we implemented a survey in the uh, fall or last fall where we asked our colleges to confirm who the primary on liaison was going to be for their college so that we would um, get a list going of who is really working with their students directly. In addition, we suggested for colleges to have a, a financial aid on liaisons. Uh, not everybody decided to have a financial aid. Some folks decided to have two um, you know, liaisons that work with the Undocumented Student Center, or um, perhaps some of our colleges don't even have an Undocumented Student Center. So it was really up to the college to decide who were the members of this network. In addition, we also had um, at our, we asked our colleges to, to include an administrator who will be responsible for implementing AB 1645. And that's really who makes our Undocumented Sun Network. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> And um, within the network, what we do is we meet regularly um, to, to learn, like, you know, the purpose of the calls is really to identify the challenges, like what's going on in our colleges. We, we really want to understand, and it was part of the survey, right? Like what, what's the landscape? Where are we as a system? And then how do we move forward? How do we elevate promising practices? And also what, are, what is it that our undocumented liaison, um, you know, need? Next slide, please. <coughs> And how we hope to accomplish and, and, and really, you know, like the purpose of this webinar is um, I wanted to give you a big overview of, of where we, you know, we are as a project. And what we did is we created um, two different um, committees. So one, it's our advisory committee who has representation of, uh, of seven. So all of our state is divided in seven regions using the guided pathway uh, region. So our advisory committee is conformed of seven uh, leads from those regions. We also have representation from the chancellor's office and key statewide partners that um, you know, support undocumented students. On the other side, we also had um, a, a task force within the chancellor's office. And the idea was to really bring uh, content experts to join, you know, the conversation around undocumented students in order to, for us to really think about the work that we're doing statewide. And our goals or our outcomes, what we're hoping to accomplish is to be able to create a toolkit um, that we plan to disseminate in, in, the, um, in the summer to be able to provide guidance to colleges. Um, but it was important for us to, to really get a group of folks um, together that were experts. Next slide, please. Some of the things that we, um, you know, considered when we started the the system or system wide task force, both uh, you know, at the chancellor's office, it's a little bit different, but our advisory committee um, within the foundation is we wanted to have representation from all of the different departments, and not just departments, but also all of the different, um, you know, community colleges, big colleges, small colleges, uh, colleges who had centers, who didn't have centers, um, colleges that were part of like rural areas, and and you know, representation from the LA district, which is our bigger or biggest district in, in our system. Um, it was important for us that we created this because we wanted to have representation from everybody. In addition, we also wanted to create a space where all of our, our, our um, members were heard and that they, they really felt like comfortable sharing, right? Because often when we have uh, members in our task force who perhaps are, are talking or are sharing with administrators, like some of the concerns and barriers that they're facing, they may not feel. Um, you know, welcoming it in those spaces. So I think it's important that as a, as a um, you know, chair or, or a lead of, of these task force that you create a space for everybody to be able to share and to be able to, you know, their voice to be heard. And also we, we wanted to prioritize two to three goals. So I share with you where we have very specific goals. So when we think about task force, we think about all of the work that needs to happen with undocumented students. And yes, we know there's a lot of work ahead of us, but how do you prioritize one to two goals? Right? How do you make sure that you do one or two goals and work on them? And then also, and lastly, um, what's a true collaboration to make sure that not, not just um, you know, you're inviting folks to the table, but you, you 
end or you end every meeting with next steps and who is responsible for following up to make sure that the work doesn't fall on your undocumented liaisons. And, you know, just always remind, um, remind a reminder for everybody to make sure that the student voice is part of the task force and, and to make sure that, um, you know, everybody's voices is heard. So thank you for inviting me and, and it is a pleasure to, to be sharing a little bit of the work that is happening system-wide. Thank you so much, Maricela. It's really exciting to hear about the statewide efforts um, to be able to get this information um, shared in like building collective opportunities, not just at individual campuses, but taking a broader look as well. And I'm really excited to see the work of the Chancellor's Office and the Foundation of California Community Colleges. I'd like to invite all of the panelists to come back because we have way more questions than we could possibly um, take in today, but I do wanna ask a couple of them. Madeline's gonna just pin all of you. One question is that um, that we got, which is it's from Estela Vasquez, is it says to have dedicated and passionate individuals is not as hard, but making a commitment aside from their work is the hard part. Their supervisors must state that this work is part of their job to really make it an institutional effort. What kind of ideas do you have and how have you been able to navigate that on each of your campuses? I just, so I could just speak quickly for El Camino. So at El Camino, one of the things that we did as part of the undocumented task force, just to make it easier, is that we were able to identify a person in admissions and records who would be our contact there specifically for undocumented students. And that was approved by the, the Dean of Admissions and Records. We were able to then do the same thing in financial aid. So we have a person in financial aid so that when our students have questions or maybe there are um, certain um, issues that have not been resolved, we can go to this individual to get it resolved really quickly. So I think for El Camino, we've been able to kind of like have a point person throughout the campus and that has been really helpful. And then before I turn it back um, to Nancy, uh, Jesse Garcia, who's our new Dreamer counselor, she's on this call today. So I just want to acknowledge her as well. And so she um, is going to be working with a, a lot of the, the partners that we've already identified um, at El Camino. Anybody for, else? Us, for us, it was about recruitment um, to the chairs and directors of departments and saying, can you identify a staff in your team that um, would be interested in joining undocumented student ally coalition? This is like the benefits of joining. This is the commitment level. And so it was um, interesting to actually have folks email us back saying, hey, I have someone who's interested, right? Uh, or please reach out to X, Y, and Z. And so it was nice to actually get those uh, responses from chairs and directors. Makes a lot of sense. Another question that we got is from an um, says, how can you successfully advocate for undocumented students without it being labeled as activism? We want to push for positive change and support our students, but we get a lot of pushback and administrators use these terms frequently. Be an advocate, not an activist. Help us out. Yeah, in my experience here at the Salt Lake Community College, and especially again, we are in a red state, right? So it's given that context, at first we would get a lot of pushback, but then um, we started labeling and flipping like, you know, the, the logic to, we are supporting students, like undocumented students are students first. So I don't understand how uh, supporting them is being seen as activism is just student advocacy. And slowly people are starting like reciprocating that and saying like, oh yeah, I guess we're right. Like, you know, you're just looking out for your students, supporting students and providing students with what they need to be successful on our campus. So I think that was really super, you know, helpful to us. Just, I mean, you know, just giving them that questioning of saying like, how is this not student support? And then people stop and they're like, oh. Yeah. Maricela, I would ask you as well, just in terms of, I know that at Sierra College you worked previously, but also with that statewide view, how, how is the Chancellor's Office and the foundation helping people see the true result that we need to support all students? Yeah. I think um, the language has to has to change a little bit. Um, you know, for many years um, we had been educators asking for for support, right? Like for for undocumented students, like how do we get support going? I think we're at a point where um, you know, really, it's educators out of the shadows. Like we should be seeing undocumented students support as part of our equity work, um, at least within the chancellor's office or system wide. And then also, how do we use the language that it's you know kind of being used now, right? Like we're talking about guided pathways, we're talking about all of these efforts that are happening like statewide that 
um, it shouldn't be questioned whether um, undocumented students speak within that language. And instead, you know, like Alonso said, like our students are our students. And as educators, we're here to support all of our students. It doesn't matter, you know, what's their background, what, what are some of the, um, you know, barriers that they're facing. Like we're here to support all of our students. And I think that's the language that needs to change from all levels, right? Like um, at least from the chancellor's office perspective and from the foundation is we, we you know, we're here as uh, to provide services and resources to our students, all of our students, and that's part of our work. Thank you so much. We only have time for maybe one or two more questions. We're getting a lot of questions about UndocuLA trainings. So it feels like UndocuLA trainings, maybe for people that are just getting started, would be the way to then recruit their task force members. How did you guys get started with that, or what suggestions would you have? Well, uh, if I could just interject real quick. So one of the things that we did at El Camino because we had never hosted our own undocu ally training is we actually turned to Immigrants Rising because they already had all of the tools that we needed. And so they came out to our, our campus and they helped us kick off the very first ally training that we did for faculty, staff and administrators. But then they trained us. Um, and so now we do all of the trainings um, that includes um, the high school trainings as well. And I, don't, I think you might have covered the resource um, uh, book, Nancy, in the very beginning. And I think you might have even given them that link. But that is a great link to use when you're doing any kind of ally trainings. You, you, you don't have to recreate the will. And they constantly are updating it with all the newest information and the newest uh, legislation that um, impacts undocumented students in the state. Anybody else about how that got started? I utilized um, the ally training that was created by Dr. Elena Macias, uh, who used to be an administrator of, um, at Cal State Long Beach. Very extensive training, and uh, we utilized that training with her permission, and then we ex expanded um, on that training as well to include more information on legal services, mental health, and diversity um, and intersectionality of our students that we serve. Wow, okay. Um, well, there's more questions than we have time to be able to actually be able to address today, but we um, are, I'm wondering, you know, before we, um, we end, I do want everybody to take one minute if they could to fill out the evaluation that we have. So I'm quickly going to share the screen for the evaluation. Um, and then I'm going to ask our individuals to come back. Um, we just could please do the quick evaluation. We want to know how this worked for you. My colleague Madeline Villanueva is going to throw that in the chat. We definitely hope that you can participate and let us know if this was helpful for you. We are going to be looking at all of the different questions that you have um, to see if we can address them, if not in this resource and other in other spaces. Um, um, and after, I'm just going to be quiet for a minute and let everybody fill that out. And then I'm going to ask our panelists to come back. Um, and talk about what some of their um, get, you know, get some of their ideas about how they can actually support, um, give advice to all of us who are just kind of, all of you who are just kind of getting started. So um, after you fill out the short evaluation, Madeline, I think you already threw that into the chat. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, please take a minute or two to fill that out. We will be sending the recording, we'll be sending the PowerPoint as well. And I do want to actually just bring our panelists back um, to have them just tell us for um, right now, like what is just like you have three, 30 seconds, but what would be your 30 second elevator pitch to everybody who's listening today? Cynthia, why don't we start with you? Sure. I would just say that, um, especially for those of you who are on the call who are just beginning this work, uh, reach out to your network. Um, Maricela um, has her network spread out. I'm, we're part, El Camino is part of the Southern Network. And so if you are in the Southern Network and you're not going to the meetings that she's hosting, um, please join us um, and be part of those meetings. And you'll be part of a community of people that are willing to share best practices with you, um, especially if you're just beginning the, the process. I know some of you could actually be doing this webinar right now. I see some of my colleagues and my friends from up and down the state, you could be doing this webinar. Um, Charette, who I know is on this call, is doing some amazing work in the state of California. And so those of you who are doing like amazing work already, like please share it, please share it with all of us, not just in California, but across the United States. We wanna, we need to really highlight this work and amplify this work and not like 
keep it hidden. Um, I'm all about sharing. So anything I talked about, you want a copy of, just send me an email and say, I want a copy of that resource book. I want a copy of the high school <laughs> counseling training, the, the agenda. It's yours. All you have to do okay. um, is ask. Exciting. Um, That's then, really great. And then just last, connect with everybody. Girl, 30 Thursday. seconds, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's all yeah, I have. Let everybody else jump in. Okay, Anna Medium. I want to say that create smart goals. You're not going to be able to accomplish everything. So choose your priorities. Uh, trust your colleagues. Don't do the work alone. And my last recommendation is to take, um, it takes years to establish a strong foundation. So you're not going to get it right the first or second year. And that's okay. Great advice. Thank you, Alonso. Uh, absolutely. I would say or add, um, don't forget about undocumented students with no DACA. Again, the conversation has shifted to people with DACA only, and that's not a reality. Um, and two, like, let's also be more expansive later on or right now about undocumented people on our campus who may not be students, such as workers, right? So again, that's another side piece that we need to focus on as well. Thank you so much. So really important. And Marisela, what would you say? I think um, this is really a message for those that, you know, don't know where to start. Um, I would say start by getting a meeting together without necessarily calling in a task force. Get all of your, um, you know, student services departments and ask them what is the pathway for undocumented students to enroll in our colleges. Start with that question, have them answer the question, and you'll see that, um, you know, folks will see that there's the need for task force um, on your campus. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you. We really appreciate your participation. We're at 11 o'clock. We have to bounce, but I'm wondering if you can put your um, put your contact information in the chat. We'll also be sending it out as part of the um, recording that we send. And again, I just want to thank all of you for participating. Um, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. If you have questions, hit us up, hit up these amazing panelists. And again, um, much gratitude. Thanks to the team behind the scenes at Immigrants Rising for making this possible. And we hope you all have a great day.